Mike, I have to, I have to finish a sewer meeting that I was in, and I just want to let you know that I will be in short. Okay? Oh, sure, sure. Thank you. Do it ranks over FinCom. I get it. I heard you. So I'm going to start reading the script, and hopefully we'll get to a quorum by the time um, I'm done doing that. Stephen, if I could get you. So Peter Schaefer and Chris Kowacki are not coming, but Stephen, if you wouldn't mind. Peter, Sch Peter Schaefer's here. Schaefer's here. Oh, sorry, Peter sorry, Peter McEachern. I'm sorry, Peter Schaefer. Sorry. Um, if you don't mind texting Joe and Jill and George sure. and see if we can get one of them to come because otherwise we have to cancel, which I don't want to do after everybody's made time for this on their calendar. Okay, uh, members of the public wishing to participate, oh, I'm calling to order the Finance Committee meeting on July 27th at 4 p.m. Uh, being held on Zoom. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full name for Zoom access. If full names are not used, people will not be allowed to participate in the discussion. The town reserved the right to remove any member of the public from the meeting who doesn't use a full name or acts inappropriately. As a preliminary matter, this is Denise Cronow, Chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, I'll start with Peter Schaefer. Thank you, Joanna. Here. Stephen. Yep, I saw that. I saw your lips move. Thank you. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Rick Sears. Here. Maria Bashiva. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, and Terry. Here. Here, here. Thank you. And then anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. We have Tucker Holland. Here. Brian Sullivan. Affirmative. And Brooke, knowing you, you're probably going to say something. So Brooke Moore. I am here. Thank you. <laughs> so good afternoon. This open meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Finance Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. Um, the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Uh, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude the remarks, I will ask the members if they have any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For um, if blah, 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 okay. And then that's it until the final comment, which is as usual, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Okay, we're still one short of a quorum, so. We are going to sit here for a few minutes. I sent Joe a, a text, no response. Okay. I sent everyone a text earlier, which I know you guys saw. Yep. Um, and I'm not getting a response either. Other than from Chris and Peter McEachern saying they weren't making it. I do have a tip for everyone, which is if you want to drive around easily on the island, it's 7.30 on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Optimal time to be on the roads. Scary. You don't have to go anywhere. You can just drive around. Until what? Till about 7.35? Exactly. Jill's here. Yay. Hi, Jill. OK. Hi. Sorry about that. Hello. That's OK. We are now, we're now a quorum. Thank you for Thank you, everyone. Okay, so may I have uh, approval of the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Thank you, and by roll call, uh, Peter Schaefer. 
Yes. Joanna. Yes. Steven. Yes. Jill. Yes. Chris. Oh, I didn't, I thought you weren't coming. Uh, I wasn't planning to, but Stephen said you liked a quorum, so I. Uh, okay, we have a quorum yeah. now, so if you need to dive off, you can dive All right, off. I'll, ha I'll hang for a few minutes. Thank you. Here. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I'm going to ask if there's any public comment, but I see there's no public because there's 12 participants and there's 12 people on my screen. So, and I will close public comment. May I have, um, are there any additions or changes to the meeting minutes from July 13th, 2021? Shake your head, yes or no, please. And then I'll call on you. Okay, that's a no. And so may I have a motion to uh, adopt the minutes? Motion, motion to adopt, adopt the minutes. Okay, and I'll take Joanna as a second then. Uh, Peter Schaefer. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Jill. Aye. Chris. Aye. Stephen. Aye. George. Hello, George. I'm just taking your, I'm pretending I can see your head nodding, George. <laughs> Denise, I, those are adopted unanimously. And uh, any committee reports? So right now we only have the CRC committee and the CPC, neither of which are active, I believe. So I'm asking Jill and Joanna if they have any other update? No. No, we, we meet August 12th, I think was the first. Is your first meeting, correct. Okay, thank you. All right, I jumped past the affordable housing trust update, but now I'm going back to item six on the agenda. So I don't know, Brian, do you wanna kick it off and then turn it over to Tucker? That's exactly what I'd like to do. Um, so okay. thank you everyone for having us. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come and kind of catch you up and uh, kind of touch base on all the projects that have happened and that are ongoing. Um, I will go to Tucker to- Excuse me, there is either an echo, background noise, and you're very, very hard to understand. Okay, I'll try again. Thank you. I, I think somebody muted, so maybe it's a little better. Is that better for you, Terry? Yes, that's great, thank you. Okay. Um, and Maria, I think uh, Joe Grouse is in the waiting room. If you could let him in, please. I don't see anybody in the waiting room. Maybe he was and he left. He just texted me that he was in the waiting room. If, if you would just resend him the link, maybe he's in sure, the waiting room. Maybe he's in Rick's waiting room from the other Joe, You said Joe, right? Joe Grouse. Yeah, I'll do. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Brian. No, no. <laughs> back um, to you. So, just very quickly, it's a it, for me. It's a it's a thank you for inviting myself and Tucker to update you kind of on the progress that we've had over the last eighteen months. Uh, more recently, the very successful town meeting and the funding articles that have gone through. Uh, we've had a number of. Uh, Excite, you know, exciting moments with uh, certification and safe harbor uh, that have uh, for projects that are kind of working their way through. So uh, we can work through item by item, um, and I'll I will turn to Tucker for more detail on those. But I, we do appreciate the opportunity to be here and share with the with the board. And Brian, thank you. And also, um, I would appreciate an update on your field trip to the vineyard. So, so on a high level, uh, to give everybody an idea, we, the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, the members that attended were myself and Brooke Moore. Um, we, Tucker Holland is the housing consultant, Ken Bogran as the town's real estate specialist, Libby Gibson, town manager, um, the chairman of the land bank, Neil Patterson, Jesse Bell, um, the, I don't know, director, I guess, executive director of the land bank, uh, took a field trip to the vineyard uh, as recently as last Friday. It was a really nice opportunity to spend. We must have been for eight hours together, uh, flew over in two planes. We traveled to a number of sites on the vineyard to meet various housing um, and land bank officials and learned about how they work together through a variety of ways in um, both protecting open space through their land bank and creating housing opportunities. Uh, one of the first projects we visited was a nine unit um, property in West Hisbury that was on town land 
um, and put together by the, if I remember this correctly, Tucker, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but by the Martha's Vineyard Land Trust, uh, put a project together, which was a rental project. Uh, we then visited um, another project. We visited three different housing sites um, throughout, throughout the course of the day. We also met with the land bank director over there and learned about how they, at the onset of projects, work to divide land between the affordable housing advocacy groups and their land bank to get a net gain result for the community, both in uh, preservation of land and in the creation of dwelling units. Um, and they have a variety of ways um, of housing advocacy groups from a land trust to a affordable housing group like ours. But I would say the individual meetings with the individuals were incredibly helpful. We also got an update from an advocacy group working on the housing bank bill at the state house level, um, very, uh, working very aggressively to kind of move that along. You know, the, the update there is it's you know, six years in process and there's a long way to go, uh, but they feel good about the momentum that they're making. Um, the bill has been resubmitted again uh, and so hopefully through this term, we'll get a little more traction in seeing something like that happen. So uh, all in all, I would say the opportunity for the Affordable Housing Trust and the land bank members to spend time together in such an intimate way and learn about so many projects was a, a net positive result for both groups. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brooke, as you attended, you, do you want to add any more color to what Brian just said before we go over to Tucker to give us an update on where we stand on all the projects on Nantucket? Yeah, I would say it was a really great day because of all the constituencies that joined together, as Brian indicated, like it was a, a really good cross section of town um, leaders who and um, and I think the thing that's important is that while the, the Island Housing Trust and other mostly Island Housing Trust and their land bank have done 14 um, co-acquisition projects over a number of years. And um, certainly the, the specifics of how things are done on the vineyard and what's available and how it might happen. And you know the different political landscape with six towns is very different from Nantucket, but certainly that level of collaboration and cooperation is adaptable to Nantucket. And I think all of us walked away feeling really energized about the possibilities. And um, so it was, a, it was a really, really good day. Thank you, Brooke. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, Tucker, I think it's over to you now. Or before I do that, uh, does anyone on the Finance Committee have a question for Brooke or Brian about their site visit to the vineyard? And seeing no hand, oh, Jill. You're muted, Jill, muted. Sorry, I couldn't, I can't see you for some reason. Yeah, actually. Oh. They, there you are. So did, is Tucker gonna tell us like what their land bank did? Sure, I, I mean, I can comment a little bit about it and maybe what's useful to the committee is if I circulate um, the housing policy of the Martha's Vineyard Land Bank, which has an appendix that gets into the specifics of the 14 different transactions that they've done in partnership uh, with the housing entities over there. but generally describing how they work. Um, I think it's gone both directions where the land bank has come to the housing entities, as Brooke mentioned, specifically the Island Housing Trust, which is a community land trust uh, organization on the vineyard um, with an idea or vice versa, but um, working within the existing framework of the land bank, which is very similar to the framework that our land bank would have. Uh, they typically are working together to divide up the property in the manner in which they collectively feel would best be uh, used and suit the purposes of each organization so that the acquisition of the property um, takes place at a point where the land has already been subdivided so that, or in some cases, there's a conservation restriction that their land bank would pay for. Um, but
but uh, in keeping with the land bank uh, within their rules, that's the manner in which things need to take place because other than creating housing for their own purposes, like to house their own employ employees, uh, you can't build housing for others on land bank property. So you're just saying they have to do something within zoning? Within zoning and specifically within their the, their legislation in, in terms of how they're allowed to, to operate. The one site that we visited specifically to kind of give you an idea of a project that appears very successful and the community seems to be very happy with was there was a large tract of land and uh, forgive me if I don't have the numbers exactly correct, but let's say it was about a 20 acre piece that the, that the, they had the opportunity to acquire the, uh, they needed the housing trust needed eight acres to build on to meet the zoning requirements. They reduced the area that they would do the actual building on to four acres. So the housing trust bought the eight, the land bank bought the 12, and then only needing four of the acres to actually build on, they moved the development to there. The land bank put a, um, or, the, or they put a, a conservation restriction on the remaining four acres to only allow the septic system and the wells. And thus only four of the total 20 acres was developed. The land bank was able to purchase both the restriction and the open space land so now the home ownership opportunities they created, and I think it was eight homes, um, were in that area. And that project has been there for about, I want to say almost 20 years, if I remember correctly. Was it 15 to 20, um, Brooker Tucker? Yeah. Uh, so that was, that was considered a very successful project that each of the owners has been in the homes for long term. Um, and the conservation restriction has to be placed on the property prior to the land bank owning the property. So these aspects of the deal need to happen prior to them taking title. So that was an excellent example of it working. Have they met their shy requirements? So they, it's an interesting um, situation on the vineyard, which we've known for a number of years. So the short answer is no. I, I don't believe there's, there may be one of the six town that has met uh, the requirement, but for the most part, they haven't but they are not under the same um, pressure, for lack of a better word, that a place like Nantucket is with respect to 40B development because they have the Martha's Vineyard Commission, which is a super regional planning agency that came to be around the same time that the 40B law was enacted. And at that time, the Martha's Vineyard Commission was effectively given a veto right over 40 Bs. So they do not have a developer proposing what might be considered an unfriendly 40 B. It just never would happen because the developer would never invest and take that kind of risk. So they, they can have a 40 B, but but it would only be like with the blessing of one of the towns there. And, and to be clear on what that timing was, the original um, Martha's Vineyard Commission was created in 1976 and then ratified in 1977 and has been standing since then. So it's been a long in place commission. How do they have so much authority? That's the way it was set up in the original legislation. Hmm. Somebody looked ahead, basically. Okay, Tucker, on to what's happening on Nantucket, please. Sure. Um, so there are a number of different things um, happening. Uh, and again, we appreciate the opportunity to update the committee. Um, I'll maybe just talk uh, about several of the projects that are really um, in the works and then open it up to questions. I don't want to go on too long and perhaps get into an area that isn't a particular uh, concern or interest to uh, the committee. But um, I think Brian touched on a moment ago um, some big news that we had in recent months in terms of uh, two of the projects that the trust has uh, supported uh, financially 
specifically 31 fairgrounds, a 22 unit project and a three unit project of habit, uh, habitat for uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, located at Benjamin Drive, collectively um, were able to come online at uh, the critical point, if you will, with respect to establishing a new period of safe harbor as of June 11th, uh, 2021. That will run for one year our prior period was expiring on June 13th. Obviously, we've known about that for quite a while. And I, I guess it's fair to say that we couldn't be uh, more pleased uh, in working with DHCD and a host of folks to, um, uh, to arrive uh, at that goal, which we view as central to the funding that the voters supported uh, back in 2019. Um, so, um, to talk a little bit about where those projects are at, um, uh, Habitat is in the final stages, uh, and Joe, I know, is on the call here, and he can speak to, with even more specificity, but uh, in the final stages of, um, uh, let's say, finalizing the regulatory agreement with uh, DHCD and therefore allowing the um, marketing process to go forward to select uh, the folks who will have those homes and, and get into the construction of those three units. And it's my understanding, and again, Joe might be able to add some color here, that those three units are intended to come online in approximately 12 to 16 months. Again, the families themselves have not been selected yet. With respect to 31 Fairgrounds, that project um, received its special permit approval last December. It actually went for a minor modification uh, earlier this summer that was approved by the planning board. It was not appealed and therefore they're full steam ahead on the HDC um, uh, approval process. Uh, one of the buildings has already been approved. It's a combination of, of four buildings in effect that make up that project. Um, and they are actually, I believe, before the HDC as we speak, um, working on the approvals for the additional uh, structures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, it's anticipated that the HDC process uh, may take another um, month or so. Uh, it is, you know, there are a number of uh, components to to what's happening there, but um, the Builder is in the preliminary stages with the modular company that will be producing the buildings. And it is anticipated that that project will start to come online uh, in the second quarter of uh, 2022 with all units anticipated uh, to be filled by about this time next year. So in the next 12 months. Um, so I guess the next project that might makes sense to talk about is the Richmond Wildflower Acceleration Program. Um, that is a uh, program that the trust uh, was able to work with both Richmond and DHCD to not only accelerate, uh, so this is going to bring more units online more quickly than by a factor of a year or two than otherwise Richmond would have done on its own. Um, and so it's, it's doing what they already planned to do. This is not additional uh, units, but it's accelerating the speed of them. It is increasing the affordability of them. So originally these 24 units would have had six 80% AMI units and the rest would have been at market rate, you know, per the workforce housing uh, bylaw. With what we're doing, six of the units will actually be at the 50% AMI level and a, an additional six uh, will be at the 100% AMI level. And the final 12 will obviously be at the market rate. So we were able to also work with DHCD to um, 
arrive at an understanding that not only will these units count on our SHI list, which they always would have, but that they will also be eligible for certification, which is in effect safe harbor. So Richmond is going, it already has received obviously the original special permit approval. They have also now received the HDC approval. And there is a final aspect that is with the state in terms of hurricane uh, resistant window compliance, um, which is something they've had to deal with uh, at uh, with everything that they've done so far. And they anticipate getting that approval from the state uh, in the next four weeks approximately. So within the next two months, we think it's realistic that we will be going back to DHCD once they have pulled the building permits for these 24 units and requesting that additional, uh, that amended certification for the additional year. And that would carry us from a safe, stand, safe harbor standpoint until June 11th of 2023. Um, so in addition to those things, um, let's say that we had a certain amount of control over. We also received some additional good news from the state in that a tax credit award has now been uh, reserved for the six fairgrounds project, Tacoma Green, which is a, to remind the board, a 64 unit uh, project located immediately adjacent to the police and fire facility. So um, one of the things about that project is given the long delay um, due to the neighbor appeal of the special permit, um, which basically, you know, push things back three years, uh, costs have obviously changed. Um, and even with the tax credit award and as well an award from mass housing toward the workforce component of that project, it is likely that there still will be a gap in the financing required uh, for that project to go forward. So um, that is one of the reasons that um, the borrowing authorization under Article 10 at this past town meeting uh, was important that um, there be resources should the town um, come to turn. Well, first of all, we don't know exactly the number that's going to be required yet, but uh, order of magnitude, we're talking about four or five million, at least based on a prior estimate. And construction costs are starting to come down in some manner. Uh, and the developer now with the news of this award is working diligently, I'm sure, on um, getting final numbers from their builder. And at some point, uh, it's likely they will come back to us and say, here's what we need. So on the presumption that we can find terms that we could agree on uh, with them, um, then, uh, that's where a portion of that money would it be intended to go. So um, those are the things kind of on the immediate horizon. As well, the board is aware, uh, the commi uh, committee is aware that we um, acquired property at 135, 137 Orange Street. Uh, that has the capacity under local zoning to do as many as 32 units. Um, the trust is in the process of considering the timing of moving that forward. Um, there, that was originally viewed as uh, a good property for another um, period of safe harbor, uh, you know, keeping our eye on maintaining that here on out until we ultimately reach the 10%. But uh, I mean, I, I, I think there's, there's debate going on, you know, given the, 
the severity of the housing issue here on whether that should just be moved ahead more immediately and um, we can look to uh, perhaps another solution at the time it's needed with respect to safe harbor a little further down the road. And we do also have the host, excuse me, the UMass property uh, in the, you know, within the hospital campus area, um, which is a property where you, you would not do 24 units on that site necessarily. And that's a location that we're working, you know, we want to work closely with the hospital on uh, to develop in a manner that's consistent with their plans. And so, you know, we see that uh, in combination with a to be determined uh, additional site a, in combination as another 24 unit or year of safe harbor um, contributor. Uh, Tucker, just yes. while, you're, while you're going on that, the the number of additional units we would need from a secondary site, just so the, the board understands that aspect. So the UMass property will provide. Yeah, I, in, in, in round numbers, you know, that, that might provide, you know, a dozen to 16 units. And so we'd be looking for eight to 12 at another location. I just wanted to put an order of magnitude as far as the cost yeah. on that. I mean, technically speaking, we, we could do, uh, according to uh, Leslie uh, at the planning department, you know, we could do 19 units at that site. I'm not sure ultimately when you try to, you know, factor in for parking and, and um, you know, adequate uh, buffers and so forth, whether we would yield 19 units. Um, so to go over you know, like how have we spent the money? Where have we committed the money? Um, uh, you know, 135, 137 Orange Street. Uh, and I'm speaking when I talk about the money to date is the 25 million uh, that was appropriated in 2019. Uh, 135, 137 Orange Street, you know, has been acquired. And I'm gonna use round numbers here, you know, and that approximately was 3.5 million of the uh, funds that were available. Um, there is support for Habitat um, at the Beachgrass Road development where they're doing two units um, that were the units that would clear the ability um, for units to be included on the SHI list going forward. Um, we have uh, spent um, roughly 2.6 million on the acquisition of the UMass property. Unfortunately, UMass did not look after the structure that was there very well. And we do have um, monies reserved toward basically demoing and removing that building. Um, 31 Fairgrounds, uh, it was a $3.6 million grant uh, to Housing Nantucket, which is the local nonprofit we're working in partnership or collaboration with on this project. Um, that was for the land acquisition. And then there is a $6.75 million loan for the actual construction that will uh, uh, be going out you know, over the course of this next year, obviously, as the project is completed. Um, the Richmond Wildflower Acceleration uh, is a, another 2.6 million that is structured as a $925,000 grant for the affordability buy down. And then that actually also too is a loan um, that is paid back uh, over an extended period of time. Um, finally, from- Tucker? The, yes. Sorry, just a quick question on it. On the affordability buy down, the 925, didn't you say that there were 12 units that were affordable, some 80s and some 50s? 12 is the correct number, Joe. Uh, and so there were 80s that went to 50s and then markets that went to 100. So my, my question is 925 doesn't seem like enough money to buy down 12 units, but I don't know what the actual price is you're expecting you know, to sell them for and, and that sort of thing. But um, uh, Well, the rent, the rental units um, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Never mind. No problem. No problem at all. Um, so uh, then finally, out of that original 25 million, um, we do have 3 million reserved for that land purchase um, that we mentioned in conjunction with the Vesper Lane site in order to get uh, to the uh, 24 units for that future year of safe harbor. Um, so as the board knows, um, you know, we were very appreciative of the unanimous support for articles uh, 8, 10, and 24 at the past town meeting, both by the finance committee and ultimately by the voters. Um, the intention of article 24 uh, has always been and remains to be as subsidy toward um, 135 and 137 Orange Street. Uh, then, um, as I mentioned, most likely the borrowing authorization, a portion of it from Article 10 um, would be used again if terms can be agreed upon uh, between the town and the developer um, to enable uh, the build out of uh, six fairgrounds, which obviously has been in the works for quite a while, and the housing is uh, undoubtedly needed. I guess a side note on um, just demand that's out there, the Affordable Housing Trust had a meeting last Tuesday on July 20th, and David Armanetti of the Richmond Group shared uh, with the group that they presently have 450 households of course of different sizes that they have vetted that are looking for a rental property from, from them. In addition to the vetted list, according to Dave, they have another 500 expressions of interest from other households. So uh, demand certainly seems uh, to be strong out there. Um, and um, there will be future uh, subsidy required uh, when we are building out uh, Vesper Lane and the, the pocket TBD site. Um, uh, you know, in round numbers, you know, we would estimate that that to be uh, in the you know ten to twelve twelve million dollar range, but it's it's a little it's a little tough to pinpoint um, given all of the dynamics uh, at present. In terms of other things of significance that the trust is thinking about for the future, um, we uh, of course uh, we have made. Um, reserves in our planning for what Habitat is planning to do over the course of the next you know, 24 months. And we constantly are in touch with them about projecting their needs. Uh, a lot of what we um, do in terms of the funding for Habitat, we do uh, in collaboration uh, through a application to the CPC um, and the majority of the funds for the Habitat projects do come from there, similar uh, with, ha with Housing Nantucket. Um, so in terms of the big, you know, other big things that the, the trust is thinking about and where we might be looking for financial support um, in the future is around um, this land trust and down payment assistance uh, uh, program. Um, part of, in addition to wanting to learn, uh, all of us who went on the trip wanting to learn about how the land bank on the vineyard interacts with the housing entities over there, we also wanted to learn more about how the Island Housing Trust operates and the benefit of the community land trust model, which we do not have here on Nantucket today. Um, uh, has helped them in achieving uh, their 
housing goals on the on the vineyard in particular around ownership. So what it's at the early stages. I'm not sure how much I you know detail I can go into here today, but this is something that we have been thinking about uh, and we'll be thinking a lot more about in terms of, you know, can there be a public private type of um, collaboration in a land trust uh, model. So uh, I hope that wasn't too long winded and I, at this point I might open it up to questions. Thank you, Tucker. Um, where, uh, Stephen, go ahead, Stephen, then Joanna, and then I have a question as well. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, Tucker, when you mentioned the potential need for another four or $5 million for Tacoma Green, um, you suggested that that was something that the Affordable Housing Trust had its eye on uh, when you were coming up with your request that became part of Article 10. Did I hear that right? It, it's one of the possibilities for it. it. It didn't come up in any of our discussions here when you presented about what was the need for that for that borrowing capacity. Well, I think I'm trying to remember, Stephen, precisely when the developer came to us to say, hey, you know, we have an issue with um, the numbers. And uh, it's certainly, I'd have to go back and look at my notes, so to speak, or my emails uh, around that. But that was, it was probably in the, you know, March, April timeframe when they first raised this possibility. And of course, we've been saying, well, you know, we need to understand that better. Um, and to date, we, we haven't gotten sort of specific numbers from them. I know that I mean, I would expect that they know if they're coming to uh, the trust, the finance committee, the town for financial assistance, if you will, that we're going to want something for that because that was never part of the deal. The deal was we're putting up the land, we're going to bring the road and the utilities to the doorstep and everything else is your responsibility. So that, so we're under no obligation to provide funds. I want to be clear about that. Okay, I, I for one would be interested in knowing the date that the housing trust was made aware that this might be a potential use for those funds because it wasn't explained to us and it wasn't part of our discussions or our recommendation. You know, the conversation at the time was about this six and a half million dollars would be used for 31's Fairgrounds Road, maybe for Orange Street and potentially for some other new developments. So I, I, I would appreciate it. Um, and through you, Madam Chair, if we could request that we get some dates around when that information was made available to the town. Tucker, if you would follow up on that and send it to me, then I can forward it to the rest of the finance committee. Sure, I, I, I'll look through my email. It, it, you know, it was, it may or may not be an email. It may have been a phone call, but I'll do my best to get you what I've got. No doubt you okay. have. And, and, and I think, you know, part of my concern here is that the town has a long history with this uh, particular developer and property manager uh, asking for money after promising not to ask for money. Um, so this might be an opportunity to, um, to break that trend. I think, I think that there's some escalation in costs and inflation that we've seen happening. This project, not dissimilar to the extensions we saw over the fire station project and things taking more time, becoming more expensive as it takes to get the shovel in the ground. You know, we wanna make sure that you know, there is an opportunity to get this project done because it manages so much of our safe harbor uh, opportunities that are out there and the tax credit. So it, while as Tucker explains, there hasn't been a formal request um, but a statement of potential need, then that is why now the consideration is, okay, where are we going to look to find that? And as he mentioned, he still has work to do with Brian on how to figure out the bonding and if that can be done or not. So, um, you know, we, a project that has gone this far down the road over this many years, we don't want to see it go any further off the track than it has. 
We don't, Brian, but at the same time, we need to be fiscally responsible and the developer themselves have other avenues of financing other than just looking for the town. So I think that's the conversation that would be of concern to the finance committee um, as we take a look at this. So we just wanna make sure that we don't take the path of least resistance for the developer in because you end up with a situation where I don't want to say the town is over a barrel in terms of trying to do something sensible here. And at the same time, you get to a certain point with a partner that says, oh, well, you know what? Now we need this because there is a history of that with, with um, having happened before. So I think that's the, you know, it's just to, it's just to be prudent. Um, Joanna, you had a, your hand up and then Jill, I'll come to you. Yeah. Yes, I have, I think, two questions. One of which is that um, similar to what you guys are talking about with that particular T Tacoma Green project, what is the benefit to the town of, you know, giving them the money? What do we get? Like by making up that difference? Well, so the first thing I would say is, um, and I'm just speaking for me, um, not necessarily for the trust or anyone else, but I certainly wouldn't be proposed. I certainly wouldn't propose giving them the money. I mean, the, the, I would expect that um, we would we would want some stuff for this. I don't know that um, that we want to get too far in the details right here, um, but uh, I certainly would see this being uh, money that we got back. Uh, that uh, we might um, get some sort of participation in conjunction with it. Um, there are any number of things we might want to negotiate. Um, but at this point, we haven't been formally asked to do anything. Um, and I certainly would welcome uh, anyone from the finance committee who would like to be a part of um, thinking about and negotiating this, if we get to that juncture, um, you know, to to participate. Mm -hmm. But oh, okay. Second question that I have um, is probably much more simple. Of that twenty-five million dollars that you originally got, right? Yeah. What is the dollar value? What is the amount of that twenty-five million dollars that is a loan? And what is the giveaway? Or the expenditure. So, you're asking how much of the 25 million that we've <laughs> committed to has been structured as a loan? Correct. So that would be the 6.75 million that is the loan with regard to the construction at Fairgrounds Road, uh, 31 Fairgrounds Road. That is um, a loan to Housing Nantucket, and then the loan. Uh, to um, Richmond regarding the acceleration is 1.675 million. Uh, those are the two portions that are structured as loans. And what are the terms of those? Are they like 30 year mortgages? Like how does that work? They're long, though, they're even longer than that. They're, they're both uh, 50 year terms. Uh, in the case of Housing Nantucket, it's a nominal, um, percentage rate, I think a half a percent. Um, in the case of Richmond, it's, uh, it's a little, it's a little higher than that. Um, I don't want to misquote the number. So I will send you the exact figure, okay. the interest rate. Okay. And then my last question is about the down payment assistant program. So I, I and correct me if I'm wrong, the down payment assistant program was part of either article eight or 10 or one of these articles that we know, which one is it, which article is it part of? Eight. It's part of eight. So when does that, who's administering that program and when does it go into effect? Oh, I'm so, the. I, I'm sorry, I thought you were speaking of the closing cost assistance program. Yes, sorry, closing cost assistance, whatever, oh. whatever we pass the money for, yes. Yes, that was part of Article 8, and that, I mean, that's constantly, the trust is response, you know, I you and the trust, yeah, we're doing that, and that's constantly happening. That's been a program that's been in existence for the last roughly four years. Yes, I, I did know that, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's it. 
Thank you, Joanna. Uh, Stephen, uh, Jill had her hand up next, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, I guess just on a big picture level, just so I can think about going forward, because I'm trying to get an idea of how much money you're going to ask for, ask for again. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that's just being realistic and you might as well set some expectations sooner than later, Tucker. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, right. So when you say, you know, and, and you're making great progress and I, I see that, I mean, I, I see it on paper anyway. I know it takes a while to get this stuff done and to get people in their buildings. But when you're talking about 500 people on the list, I mean, is your, are you thinking of every single person who gets on the list you want to build something for? Is that what you're thinking or do we, and also in that, do we know when the census is going to be able to tell us what they think our population is? So what's our legal obligation on the front end and then what sort of you might say our moral obligation beyond that uh those tucker, are great tucker if i may just real quick yeah it's, sorry it's, go ahead it's it's 450 households so not individuals so it's significantly more people than 450. yeah no i i get that but um that's our number now but don't we think it's going to change well, I think Brian was clarifying that the number from D Dave Armanetti was that they have 450 households vetted, on vetted households yeah. that are interested in in uh, rental opportunity. Um, okay. You're, I think you're uh, referring correctly, uh, Jill, to the 490 number that is our current 10 percent target. And my understanding uh, from our housing production plan consultants um uh judy barrett and jen goldson is that likely within the next three months or so we're going to get the new number uh the new target that we uh will have and i if you're asking uh you didn't but if you're if you did uh you know my best guess is that our our requirement is more likely to go down than to go up, in my opinion, um, when you think about what actually has been built as of the time of the 2020 census when it was taken um, and what we've lost in terms of year round homes when they have been sold, uh, uh, not necessarily going to the next year rounder. So. We know that the erosion of year-round homes, uh, I shouldn't, I won't say we know, but uh, kind of common sense might say the erosion of year-round homes is outpacing the creation of new year-round inventory. And, and it's the year-round part of our housing stock that is the only relevant part with regard to our 10% requirement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen, then Joe, because that's the order of which hands are raised. Jill, were you all set? Jill? Uh, yeah, okay. although I just, I was kind of wondering what they're thinking about for the next year. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, as I said, the, there are a couple things that that we need to, decide the trust needs to decide on i mean one is when when orange street moves forward you know is that held off like as as safe harbor insurance for lack of a better description or because of the need do we want to get that going asap and then that that would affect it potentially you know what we might require nearer term the other part is this land trust that we were talking about in terms of, you know, that the, I think the goal there would be a public private partnership on that. And I, I don't, I don't like asking for things before we know what we need. So I, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I, I don't want to give you misinformation either. Thank you, Stephen, and then Joe. Um, how did the conversation come to pass with Richmond. Um, they've got 450 households that they've vetted who are ready and looking for housing. Seems to me that they have an incentive already to go out and build those homes. Um, why are they looking for 
town grants and sub subprime 50 year mortgages to incentivize them to do that? Uh, I, I guess I, I mean, in, I don't know if Dave can answer that question better than, or in Phil, that can answer that question better than I can. So the question wasn't asked when they came and said, hey, we need $2.6 million to do something that it seems there's a market need for. They've demonstrated it to you. They couldn't go to a commercial lender. Uh, are we worried that they're not credit worthy? Are we worried that they can't perform? Or there's some reason that the public markets wouldn't afford them the financing to to go forward with this long approved plan? So again, I'm not sure that I can answer for them. We talked to them about what, you know, what are you planning to do next? And they are planning to do a, they're finishing up at the time, they were finishing up their original 98 units and they were planning to do 16 additional units within the Meadows 2 development and we, um, had said, well, you know, we, you know, we would like to see things, you know, moving even quicker. Uh, and is there an opportunity to do that? And so, um, I suppose out of that conversation is where things, uh, were born. Got it. So we approached Richmond and said, how can we help you move faster? Uh, I think they, they, it was a, a combination, I, or um, it's not the right way to say it, but um, I, think it was, I would say it was a, a partnership conversation based on shy list management and certification to maintain safe harbor and as a goal of the community to manage and maintain safe harbor, uh, that was the impetus of the acceleration. But, but um, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, there are no shy eligible units created from this funding. There's the acceleration of the production of the units. But if I remember the last time we looked at that timeline chart, they're not, this isn't the right way to phrase it, but they're not needed, so to speak, to qualify for this or the next safe harbor period. Uh, no, that's not quite right. Um, so these units, they, they always were gonna count on the SHI list when they were built, let's say. That is accurate. But um, it's a, I don't know if this is getting too far into the weeds, but it, the, there is a quirky situation with R Richmond in particular in that there was a large lapse of time between their original special permit issuance and ultimately the approval of their local action unit application, which is what we submit to DHCD in order to have units be eligible for inclusion on the SHI list. Because that time period was over two years in length, um, it created the situation that in order for their units, even with the LAU approval to be included, on our list, it further required or requires their pulling of the building permits for each of the units that they're creating. So when DHCD thinks about what is eligible to be included on the SHI list and moreover, what is eligible to be included toward certification or safe harbor, the operative point is when the units were first eligible to be included on the list. And so normally when you have a large project, the, you're not, you don't have this gap. And because of the unique circumstances here, DHCD has said, well, technically these units that you're creating 
never were eligible before. Therefore, even though you got a two-year period of safe harbor from Richmond back in 2019 that took you to 2021, these additional units that you are creating are eligible to go toward certification in combination with the fact that you're, you're bringing down the affordability level. So it's, it's a bit unique. Okay, and, and for my own edification, where do I find that timeline chart that you put together that was really handy to see when things are coming online? Uh, or not, not online, but you know, eligible for SHI list inclusion. Uh, um, it, like, is this what you're referring to, or no? It was no. it was a, like a longitudinal. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I, I I can I'll I'll forward that to the group as well. It's Thank also you. on the town website, Brooke. I'll get to you in a second. I see you waving your hand. Believe it or not, I keep seeing you, so don't worry. <laughs> you are seen, Brooke. Um. So it's also isn't it Tucker also on the town website? So if you also send the link to everybody as well, rather than just a document. Happy to do that. That's great, because that's where I found it one time trolling around. Um, Brooke, and then Joe, I'll get to you, but Brooke has been waving, 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 so. Yeah, I, I wanted to add a little more color to the process of all of this, because um, we that, that timeline, as you'll see, we thought Tacoma Green was gonna come online um, with a tax credit. And, and the, the, um, the last appeal kicked that project out of the running <clears throat> for the regular LIHTC financing last fall. So in essence, we were playing this juggling act of um, watching what was going on with the Tacoma Green Appeals and the LIHTC financing, which was completely out of our control and trying to line up backup programs to make sure we filled that gap starting on June 13th, 2021. And so the trust was actively pursuing multiple options to make sure we had 24 units certified by June 13th of 2021. And the problem here, and I think Tucker doesn't talk about this enough, that that, that is not a process by which in which we have a whole lot of control because it's the planning board approving 31 fairgrounds, it's um, DHCD processing and accepting the LAU application. There's so many variables in this lining up that our pursuit of this opportunity at uh, Richmond was sort of the plan B or the plan C that ended up becoming the plan B because Tacoma Green was not eligible for financing is yet been actually They've been granted it, but it, it actually won't line us up for safe harbor with them. So the the what we gained from this financing and grant scheme with um, Richmond is both people in units faster, deeper affordability, and this, and then in that process, we discovered this sort of amazing opportunity to actually that that they would be eligible for safe harbor. So now they've they will add a second year of safe harbor to the 31 fairgrounds, which we didn't know for sure would come online in time either. So we were sort of per pursuing multiple lines of safe harbor simultaneously. It was unnerving to say the least. Thank you, Brooke. Joe? I'm just sort of curious, Tucker or anybody on the Affordable Housing Trust, where, what is the uh, sort of current expectation for when you'll hit 490 or whatever our new shy target's gonna be. Um, you know, it sounds like we're talking about 24 odd units for Safe Harbor as being kind of the plan for the next couple of years. But I guess I seem to remember that Richmond was supposed to be a, you know, 200 units of the 400 and um, that we were gonna, you know, there were sort of a, a horizon that said, well, we're actually gonna to get to 490 at, you know, whatever, four years, five years, something like that. So you, you have it exactly right. Joe, uh, we're at 273 units on our list today. Uh, so we're at 5.5% toward the 10% requirement. And within the next four years, like everything going according to plan, we would be at the 490 units. Um, I appreciate uh, what Brooke just said there. And I just wanna add that um, 
you know, we we felt, you know, it was uh, we felt a mandate to the trust with the twenty five million dollars that was entrusted to us to keep, you know, keep Nantucket in safe harbor. So that, you know, we we were not going to roll the dice on just one strategy. We we need, knew that we needed to have multiple irons in the fire. And I I, I didn't mentioned this before, but I want to make sure the finance committee understands that if six fairgrounds moves forward, meaning if they need some money and we decide as a town with finance committee input, et cetera, that we, there are terms and under which we want to do that and so forth and so on. When the tax credit award is officially issued, which would happen after they knew that this project will indeed happen, um, the date of that award issuance will initiate a new period of safe harbor for two years, whenever that is. So that could, you know, if that were to happen this fall, as an example, uh, it, it will it will cannibalize, so to speak, our current period, but that's just how DHCD accounts for things. Sorry, it'll be the last thing I say for a while. Um, the, the safe harbor period that we have now, um, it, it, it's a year from June 13th. June 11th. 2021, June 11, 2021. But then there was also mention of something that's going to get us to June 11th, 2023. Correct. That's, and that, that's, that's the, different from Tacoma Green. Yes. And that is precisely the Richmond wildflower acceleration. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Peter. Yeah, Tucker, does this timeline that you're talking about cover every single project that's that would affect the shy list? Um, if it's the one, if, if I understand the one that Stephen's referring to that I think we may have shared like back at a FinCom meeting in the in the March timeframe, if I'm remembering this right, uh, that, that does cover all of the major projects. It may not account uh, directly for, for example, if Housing Nantucket were doing a house move and creating one new rental unit, you know, it, it, it might, that, that graph might not have incorporated that particular aspect, but, but it is, it is the plan for remaining in safe harbor. And uh, Tucker, I don't believe that it would include kind of the makeup project, which is not yet identified for the UMass property off of Vesper, the, the shortfall on units there. there. There's kind of a budget line, but there's no actual, like we haven't defined the project yet, if that makes sense. So, so you know, this is, we have scattered facts, you know, between Brooke and Brian and Tucker. If we could take your minds and put them on a piece of paper, that would be great, but we can't do that. And I, you know, I feel that we don't have um, anything documenting the entire situation. We have pieces from here, pieces from there, but nothing that's cohesive and total. And if I'm wrong, tell me. Well, um, I, I think I understand your point. I think that the, the piece uh, that was prepared for town meeting, which was uh, re referenced in the invitation to us uh, to come and speak today, um, you know, we, and I'm referring to this, I don't know if you can see it here, um, but you know, this, this was intended to be somewhat of a summary document. Um, we weren't asked to provide ad additional materials for today, but we are more than, more than happy to uh, provide whatever would be helpful to the finance committee. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, just to talk, I'm sorry, Peter, to, uh, to Tucker's point, I said, just use your existing materials. Don't prepare something new just for us because and be able to speak to it. And then if we need something coming out of this meeting, then we can follow up. So to your point, maybe, uh, you know, one stop shopping for all these topics uh, and with a, um, the collective wisdom of Brooke and Brian and Tucker would be just helpful, not only for us, but for voters as they understand what they're voting on as they talk about the different financing options. And I think there has been things floating around. I, I agree, Tucker, I've seen stuff that makes sense. And I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a huge leap to get to what Peter's describing. So, I agree, I agree. Thank you. Joanna? Okay, one, I have a question. Just about the 490 units. So right now of the, of the units that are on the shy list, how many of them belong to the Richmond group? Uh, right now, uh, there are 98 units from the Richmond group on the list. And are they all occupied? Yes. Every single one? Yes, to my knowledge, yes. Okay, just curious. And so, I mean, because in, in the 490 makeup, do you guys track the occupancy of that? And are we sure that all these units are occupied, you know, 12 months a year on a regular basis? Because oh. it, I, there's, they belong to so many different people, it seems. You mean the, the basis for the 490? Yeah. So yeah, so the basis for the 490, I mean, the, the year round determination is, is done by the census folks. So back in 2010, they determined that there were 4,896 residences on Nantucket of the approximately 11,000 total residences on the island that they deemed to be year round. So that is, that is, that is the, the basis from which we have to work. And the state takes that number and mm -hmm. says, it, technically speaking, just for whatever it's worth in the law, it doesn't distinguish between year round and seasonal. It's always been the practice of DHCD to only require the year round, 10% of the year round portion. So, so, it's the, so Tucker, if the census came back, yep. it, uh, there are now 2,700 year round residents, residences on Nantucket, we would be, we'd be done. We'd be at our 10%. You're correct. Let's see. Math. And did you answer Jill's question about um, when we expect that uh, census information or when do you expect it? Yeah, we, uh, we talked a little about it. Uh, so according to Judy Barrett, who is the consultant we just worked with on the updating of the housing production plan, and I didn't mention to the group, but um, we, the, the trust over the course of the last uh, eight months or so has been working with Judy and Jen, who are the two foremost consultants on housing production plans in the state on updating our plan. Our last plan was approved in 2016. They need to be updated every five years. The one of the, in addition to it being a roadmap, you know, for the community on how to address uh, the community's housing needs and goals, uh, one of the big benefits of having an approved plan is it cuts in half the number of units required to get a year of safe harbor. So we've always known that we want to have our plan updated in a timely way. Anyway, off the point there for a moment, but Judy Barrett, um, who uh, stays in close touch with the census folks indicated to us that likely in the next three months or so is when we might expect the numbers that would determine that year round figure. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brooke, you you had raised your hand. Are you and you tech? Oh, now you're getting technical. I know. I'm wow. getting good at this in after a year and a half. Um, I just, uh, I'm trying to think what thought I had. Uh, so so when, you know, Tucker had mentioned about or the timing of developing Orange Street and and that census data is gonna, is gonna inform us um, as to that timing because we may 
Uh, we may be able to do it a little faster and because we're going to be getting these series of safe harbor from the other projects that are online, you know, that, you know, that are 31 fairgrounds in Richmond and, and Tacoma Green. And we may be able to move, um, move Orange Street faster because our number may, um, if it goes down, then, then, then the whole timeline and the, and the calculus changes. So we're going to be um, having a lot of conversation around that in the fall. And then um, the other thing I wanted to hold a place for was a phrase, and I can't remember who 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 said it was about the the I think it was Jill about the moral obligation versus the legal obligation, and I I just want to hold a place for the fact that that the need on Nantucket for year-round housing extends far beyond whatever that Shilas number is. And yes, we have a lot of conversations to have about whose responsibility that it, 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 who is responsible for financing that and how we go about um, achieving um, a stable housing market for our year round community. But I just, the community land trust for us is a really interesting place to try to figure out how to move into the home ownership space, which is a completely different investment than under chapter 40B. And um, obviously the funding that we've gotten has been really generous and, and we're really appreciative of the community, but frankly, it's been driven by the demands of Safe Harbor and Chapter 40B. And there's just this huge pressing need far beyond that, that, that I don't want any of us to lose sight of. Um, we certainly aren't at the trust and, um, and hopefully um, you guys as a committee will see the value um, in, in what we hope to bring to you on this community land trust proposition um, for the community at large. Thank you, Brooke. Jill? I appreciate that, Brooke. I mean, I think it, it, I like the idea of this community land trust and what that means. I don't fully understand it. Martha's Vineyard sounds pretty different, but um, I like the idea of that because I think it's going to be hard to keep coming back and asking us for $20 million every year. And I know that's what you want to do for a number of years. I get that. Um, but I do want to make one point because um, I think I heard Tucker make a comment about year-round housings being replaced by uh, not year-rounders. And I feel like that's a bit of a political statement. And until I actually see the numbers there, no one ever really clarified that. I just want to be careful about, I mean, I just don't want you to think that I endorse you saying that Tucker is a reason to do it. There are other reasons to do it. And I just want to be sensitive to that because there were a lot of, you know, heated debates this year about that very issue. And um, so I just, that, that's all I've kind of. Well, yeah. Well, so if I could just uh, say, Madam Chair, so um, I mean, I, 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 that my, that certainly wasn't intended to be a political comment. Uh, it, I'm referring to, the 2015 workforce housing needs assessment that also was done by Judy Barrett in which it was cited at that point between 2010 and 2015, we had lost, and I'm not gonna get the exact number, but approximately 500 homes that had been year round and were no longer year round. And that was at that juncture. I think, again, just sort of common sense with the escalation of real estate prices uh, rather dramatically since 2015 might suggest that that trend is continued. So that's all I meant. Yeah, it's just, it's just a hard thing. I mean, I think Stephen has some data as well that he put together, didn't you, Steve? That, um, or somebody had some other data. I'm not saying it's not happening. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that to, it, if we think that is the underlying reason for it, we have to be careful how that's phrased. Um, because again, I, I, it became a very political issue this year. That, that's all I mean. Um, so. Thank you, Joe. Any other com comments or questions on this topic for today? I see everybody shaking their heads no. So with much thanks to Tucker, Brooke and Sally O'Brien for being here with us today. I was very appreciative. I think it's one of those topics that it is, um, it's very important to the community. And um, it, Brian, as you know, I tried to get to your affordable housing trust meetings when I can. I haven't for a while. Um, Cause I turned a, you know, a seasonal house into a year round house. 
recently. So the, there you go, there's plus one. So the, the uh, but my point being is it's, a, it's an important topic for the community. And I think that if, as, if we could be more creative on how we address it and how we get other people engaged in it and other sources of financing and not just, you know, looking to one or two same ones all the time. I think that's also an opportunity for us as a community to put our hats together and think about that. So um, thank you for the update. Thank you for the comprehensive information. I write, make a lot of notes every time you talk. And one of these days I'm actually going to be able to understand my notes after the fact. Tucker, thank you. Well well, I, 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 if I can, to... if I can just, I'm sorry, if I can just briefly thank you all again. I mean, I, we, I just want to say we find these conversations tremendously beneficial. Uh, you know, our philosophy is more smart minds thinking about, a, especially a difficult issue, the better res, the result we're going to get, you know, for the, for the community in the island. So, we would be more than happy to come back anytime. And we will um, certainly follow up on the items that you all identified for us today. So thank you. Thank you, Tucker. Um, as always, uh, Maria, thank you for your help in running the meeting. Uh, Terry's off to the HTC. Somehow she thinks it's more interesting than we are. <laughs> Hard to believe, really. Rick, always nice to see you. Brian, thank you. And uh, our next meeting will be September 21st, 2021 at four o'clock. As I mentioned before, we are staying on Zoom through the end of, uh, through the end of the calendar year, just at least for now. Uh, so, because it does encourage really great public participation, though not today. And um, so, <laughs> oh, well, can't be, you know, can't have 150 people at every finance committee meeting. And, uh, that's so any other business um, before we I ask for an adjournment. And seeing none, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank Aye. you. And by roll call, our favorite, Jill. Aye. Steven. Aye. I'm losing them. Joanna. Aye. Peter. Aye. Joe. Aye. Denise, aye. Thank you, everyone. Oh, George, sorry. George. I can see I can see the virtual wave from George. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks we'll all. See you in the fall. See you in the September. Thank you.